I want to take as my text this morning, today being the day of Pentecost, that reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. If you're making use of the Pew Bible, you can find that text on page 1081. Acts chapter 2 and beginning at verse 1 on page 1081. I want to invite you to look at that with me. And so Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and then also wrote the Acts of the Apostles, in fact, um, quite a bit of the Acts of the Apostles is something that he recorded that was about things that were told to him by eyewitnesses. And then when you get further on along, you find out that he was actually present and saw many things himself while he was with Paul on his missionary journeys. But here in chapter 2, Luke says, And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together, that is, the disciples and others. In fact, if you look at chapter 1, there was a group of 120 of them that were meeting between the time that Jesus ascended until the day of Pentecost. And suddenly there came from heaven the sound like a, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house which, by the way, is a reference to the temple. Remember Jesus saying that this is my Father's house and you've made it a den of thieves. In fact, in the Old Testament and the New, the temple is also uh, 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 very often referred to as the house of the Lord. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude rushed together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing the disciples speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished and saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, proselytes Cretans, and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues, our languages, the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, ah, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who are dwelling or staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days it shall be said, God declares, that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall see dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This morning I want to talk about Pentecost and the faithfulness of God. Pentecost and the faithfulness of God. Indeed, the, the Pentecost event has lots to teach us. And one of the things that it teaches us is that when God makes a promise... He keeps it. Now, to be sure, uh, the time that often exists between the time that God makes a promise to us and when that promise is fulfilled in our own lives isn't always just as we would have it, nor always just as we might expect. But the truth is that when God makes a promise, 
we can be sure that he keeps his promise whether the timing is to our liking or not, which is something to keep in mind, especially when our faith is being tested and we find ourselves tempted to give up on God. In fact, that was true for those to whom the writer to the Hebrews was writing. And so in his letter, in the 10th chapter in verse 23, in a, by way of a word of encouragement, he, he, he writes to those to whom he was writing, and let us hold fast. Don't give up. Let us hold fast to our hope in God without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. And so Pentecost, amongst other things, is proof of the faithfulness of God and that when God makes a promise, he keeps it. Indeed, if you go back to the first chapter of Acts, Luke tells us that after Jesus rose from the dead, we read chapter 1 and verse 3, he, that is Jesus, presented himself alive to his disciples after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during a period of 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And while he was with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which Jesus said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. And that just as God had said. Indeed, Luke says that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together, Jesus' disciples, they're waiting for the promise that Jesus said was going to come, and he told them to wait. Now, Pentecost, by the way, is one of three major feasts within the religious calendar. The first is Passover. That's probably a reference that you're more, more, more familiar with than uh, others, perhaps. Passover was associated with the barley harvest, came in the spring, and then 50 days later, in fact, that's what Pentecost means, 50. 50 days later, the second feast, Pentecost, came, which was associated with the wheat harvest. Did I say that? Passover, barley harvest, Pentecost, wheat harvest. And then the third of the great feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, came in the fall and was associated with the grape harvest. And the place where the disciples were gathered, as I just mentioned a few moments ago, was the temple. In fact, in Luke's gospel, and Luke being the writer both of the gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, at the end of his gospel, talked about Jesus before his ascension, after his resurrection, but before his ascension. And so we read in Luke 24, beginning at verse 49, and Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I'm sending the promise. <laughs> of my Father upon you. And so stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And then it says, and he led them as far as Bethany, which is on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he was parted from them as he was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him <laughs> and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. In the last verse of Luke's Gospel, and they were continually in the temple praising God. And so Luke says, and when the day of Pentecost was come, now 50 days after Passover, think about it, Jesus was, was raised from the dead on the first day of the week after the Sabbath day within the feast of Passover. He was with them for 40 days and on the 50th day, which means that they were waiting for 9 or 10 days there in the temple for what God, Jesus said, was coming. The day of Pentecost arrived and they were all together in one place and suddenly, without warning, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It wasn't a mighty rushing wind, but it sounded like it. Can you imagine trying to come up with descriptions for the things that the people in the Bible experienced themselves. I mean, when you read the book of Revelation, there's a whole lot of simile there. I saw it, and it was like this, and it was like that, and it was like this. And the day of Pentecost arrived, and they were all together, and suddenly, without warning, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house, that is, the temple, where they were sitting, on the, on the stones there, in the temple precincts. <laughs> 
And Luke says, verse 3, and, and divided tongues of fire, as if, as if there was perhaps, I don't know, this sort of this great flaming thing, and then out of it was separated tongues of fire, or, or bits of, what would you say, dollops of fire, sort of in the shape of tongues. It appeared and rested on each one of them. And when this happened, verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Just as God promised they would be. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is, that the Spirit was speaking through them. And languages, as we'll find out in a few moments, languages that they didn't even know themselves. Luke continues in verse 5 that there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That is, that there were Jews from various nations, from the east and the west, the north and the south, that had come to Palestine. They were on pilgrimage from these faraway places. And they had come to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Pentecost. They were devout and they were there. And when all of this was happening, they were in the temple. Indeed, that's why they were there, to be in the temple on such a day like Pentecost. And Luke says in verse 6, and at the sound of this, the sound of what? The sound of these, these, these voices speaking in these various different languages. The multitude came together. They, it's like if you're in a foreign country where they speak another language and then you hear somebody speaking English. It catches your attention, doesn't it? When you hear your language, in fact, if, I, if I'm watching something, maybe a, a, a lecture or something like that, you know, and it's at Cambridge or Oxford or something like that, and, and then they do question and answer period and students stand up and most of them speak with an English accent and then there'll be one American. And my ears perk up. And I'll say, she's American. <laughs> At the sound of this, the sound of the disciples' voices speaking these languages, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each was hearing the disciples speak in their own language. Verse 7, and they were amazed and astonished because, and they were saying, aren't these who were speaking Galileans? Indeed, Galileans were by and large considered by others to be provincial, unsophisticated, people who wouldn't have been familiar with, with any language that wasn't spoken within their own community, where they would have speaken, spoken Aramaic, which was Jesus' primary language. Maybe they spoke a little Greek when they were doing business, maybe a little Latin to get one of the Roman soldiers off their back, but not much. But none of these, they didn't speak the language of the Medes and the Elamites and the Parthians and the so on. And so those Jews who had come to Jerusalem from all around the Mediterranean world, who were in the temple for the peace, Feast of Pentecost, were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear from them, each of us, in our own language? Parthians, verse 9, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, that is, Jews that lived in the countries far away, east of Palestine, out in the Fertile Crescent. Those who lived in Judea, which was actually where they were. But then he mentions in Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, and Phrygia, Pamphylia, these are the lands located in what was then called the Roman province of Asia Minor, to, to the northwest of Palestine, where Paul would later go on his famous missionary journeys. And it was a journey. It was far, from far away. And all these different locales had their own dialects. And these people were hearing them from the Galileans. <laughs> People from Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, that is, lands located in North Africa, southwest of Palestine, visitors from Rome, we know where that is. Both Jews and proselytes, proselytes being Gentiles who had converted to Judaism, the men being circumcised and baptized, and these are all devout people who 
would have made, uh, taken great pains to be sure that they kept all the laws of Moses as good Jews. Cretans, that is Jews from the island of Crete, southeast of Greece on the Mediterranean Sea. Jews who made their homes in Arabia. Indeed, most of the Jews at the time, even as is true today, lived in other places than Palestine. In fact, F.F. F. Bruce, in his book on New Testament history, wrote this, At the beginning of the Christian era, all Jews throughout the world looked to Palestine and Jerusalem as their home, their spiritual home, but the majority of them lived far afield. And the list of nations mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verses 9-11, through 11, indicate clearly the wide area of the Jewish diaspora. Most Jews live somewhere else, even as they do Today, and so we read, and beginning at verse 8, and how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty deeds of God. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty deeds of God. Perhaps this is a reference to Jesus' death and its meaning, its purpose and his rising from the dead and his ascending to the right hand of the power on high and that the disciples were saying these things even unbeknownst to themselves because they were speaking in language they had never learned languages that they didn't understand but others understood those who were listening these devout Jews these pilgrims understood the languages and Luke says in verse 12 that they were all amazed and perplexed saying to one another <laughs> Seemingly, it wasn't just one language for one individual, but maybe one language for a whole group of individuals. And as they were experiencing it together, they were saying, what's going on? But then Luke says in verse 13, but others were mocking. They were saying, they're drunk. <laughs> because they didn't understand the languages. And, you know, to be fair to them, maybe that's exactly what it sounded like. They're like They were just drunk. But Luke says that Peter, standing with the eleven, that is the apostles and others, would have no doubt been there. In fact, something about the prophecy of Joel suggests that it wasn't just these twelve men, but the women and probably Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers and others were there. And the Spirit fell on all of them. Not just the apostles, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice loud enough for all of these people to hear. And he said, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. And that would have been... Nine o'clock in the morning, they counted the first hour from, from daylight, from dawn on. But he says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Quote, and in the last days, which is a very interesting expression. What is the last days? Well, according to the way in which the apostle Peter is using it, the last days begins at the day of Pentecost and continues until the Lord returns. That's exactly what he's saying here. In fact, he's saying, this is what the prophet Joel said, and we're experiencing it now. We're in the last days, as God would count days. You remember Peter says later that with the Lord, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. Which might give some sense as to why we seem to be waiting so long. <laughs> it's 2,000 years for us and two days for God. <laughs> in the last days... It shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All flesh, not just the apostles. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Why? Because the spirit, they shall proclaim my word. And your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
even on my male servants and female servants. So it doesn't make any difference gender or where you are in the social stratus. Even the slaves will receive the Spirit and speak as servants of mine on my behalf. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my Spirit and they shall prophesy. And then he continues on, and this didn't seem to have happened uh, on, on the day of Pentecost, but is something yet to be fulfilled. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood bef before, <laughs> before the end of the last days. Before the day that the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. When that comes, a new age will dawn. In the last verse, and it shall come to pass in this period from Pentecost <laughs> until the day of the Lord's returning that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And those are the days in which we're living now. And so the Pentecost event teaches us lots of things. Think of things that we might draw from it, such as uh, that when the church is operating in the way that God intends, it does so not in the power of human flesh, but in the power of the Spirit. <laughs> That's a constant prayer. I'm praying it all the time. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. And that's especially true. I got in my car and turned around in the driveway across from the, 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 the house across the street and started to head down to the corner to turn right. And I must have prayed that at least three times on the way to the corner. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And so when the church is operating in the way that God intends, it doesn't do it in the power of the human flesh. It does it in the power of the Spirit and that the message of the gospel is for all people. Another lesson we might draw, no matter where you call home. But Pentecost also teaches us that when God makes a promise, He keeps it. And this is something we mustn't ever forget, especially when our faith is being tested and we may find ourselves tempted to give up on God. I always appreciated something John Stott said in his book, People, My Teachers. He said this, It is precisely because God is faithful that faith in Him makes sense, for there is no one more faithful than God. Amen? Amen. Pentecost and the faithfulness of God. Lord, you are faithful. And those who walk with you know it. We think of the psalmist and all that they have to say. Your faithfulness reaches to the heavens. Or David saying famously, the Lord is my shepherd and because he is, I shall not want. You told Joshua that as he took the place of Moses, and lo, uh, be not afraid because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Or Jesus saying, and now as I go and as I send you into the world to be witnesses for me, remember, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Or stay in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. For not many days from now you shall receive the Holy Spirit even as He promised. And all of your promises are true. You may not always come when we want, but it seems like you're always right on time. For that we thank you and help us, Lord, never to forget it. In Jesus' name, amen.